We're so glad you're all here this afternoon here at Mitchell Hall. And uh, we take a lot of pride in this event. I'm Nancy Karabjanian. I'm with the Center for Political Communication. And we, along with the Department of Political Science and International Relations, are hosting this event with Senator Coons and a panel times two that will bring you much information about what's happening for us globally. I do wanna remind you there are photographers present. We are documenting this event. So do know that at some time you might actually be through a photo or in a photo or a video. So do be aware of that as well. So it's my pleasure at this moment to step aside and introduce the provost of the University of Delaware, Robin Morgan, who will get us started. Enjoy today's program. Thank you, Nancy, and welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today to welcome you and our special guest to Mitchell Hall. Here at UD, we foster lifelong learning. We work to cultivate passion in our students and our entire community to seek knowledge and understanding. So that's why I'm proud today to be part of this program with Delaware's United States Senator Chris Coons. Senator Coons recently traveled to China and East Asia, visiting with dignitaries, business leaders, and heads of state. His quest for a greater understanding continues today when he will speak with experts from here on campus and with former National Security Advisor Thomas Donilon. Mr. Donilon is now chairman of the BlackRock Investment Institute and is considered one of the nation's foremost and most experienced policy advisors. Mr. Donlin has advised three presidents, and today he will share his knowledge with Senator Coons and with us. Now, the way today is gonna to work, there are gonna be two panels. Um, Mr. Donlin will be in the second panel. There is no break between them, so this is, this is from beginning to end. Um, but before, so before we hear from Mr. Donlin, we're going to use some, to, to present some insight into United States relations with China and East Asia. And so we're gonna use UD experts to get us started. Dr. Alice Baugh, many of you may know her, from the Department of Political Science and International Relations, will bring her insight and expertise to the discussion. Dr. Baugh noted in her 2017 Fulbright Lecture that the status of US-China policy is to a degree predictable often subjected to the swings of the United States election cycle. It's a very opportune time to hear from Dr. Ba. Dr. Yuan Chong Wong of the Department of History specializes in modern Chinese and East Asian history. He spent five days last summer in North Korea. Dr. Wong traveled from the border to the capital to the DMZ. And moderating this discussion is Dr. Dave Redlosk, Chair and James Soules Professor of the Department of Political Science and International Relations. And finally, rounding out this first half of the discussion is United States Senator Chris Coons. Senator Coons' position on the Senate Judiciary Committee has, of course, grabbed many headlines in recent days and months, but it's his position on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that brings him here today to the University of Death Delaware for the topic we'll discuss. Please join me now in welcoming our first panel to the stage. observers by tweeting threats to increase tariffs on Chinese goods, even as the White House has indicated, trade talks are moving to a smooth conclusion. Not surprisingly, markets across the world reacted negatively, including in the US this morning. Time will tell if the talks themselves are negatively impacted. But the challenges facing the US in dealing with China go well beyond these important trade issues. And it is some of those other challenges we'll focus on in this particular roundtable this morning. 
I have a couple of questions to get us started with the conversation, but I hope it will be more of a conversation than a Q&A. My own research is American politics. I've been fortunate, though, in recent years to visit China several times and have been struck by the vibrancy of the cities that I've visited and the confidence of the people that I've met, mostly academics, about China's future place in the world. To me, this confidence is also expressed by China's Belt and Road Initiative, the infrastructure and investment in many countries well beyond Asia, including extensively in Africa. The U.S. has important concerns about this initiative, but clearly Belt and Road responds to infrastructure and development needs, while at least from my perspective, the U.S. seems to have turned inward. In effect, China seems to be moving in where we appear to be moving out. So let me start by asking Professor Ba to tell us a bit about her perspective on the Belt and Road Initiative, its importance to China, to East Asia more generally, and I assume as well there are real national security implications for the U.S. Thanks, Dave. Um, so um, my work has focused mostly on um, the politics and strategies of China's and Southeast Asia's expanding relations. Um, and since time is short, I'm just going to focus on three points. Um, the first is that you know, while there is considerable uh, concern and questions about China's initiatives in Southeast Asia, I would also argue that most and uh, that that they also respond to important regional demand in Southeast Asia. Uh, infrastructure has long factored into development strategies of both China and the Southeast Asian states. In the current geoeconomic moment as well, we have a global slowdown. We have protectionist pressures, of course, in core economies, including our own. Um, and of course, US-China trade tensions also threaten global supply chains that will destabilize growth you know, across the region. Um, in addition, right, I mean, if we look at the, um, the assessments, more than one assessment, in fact, by the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, only about 5% of those infrastructure needs will be met by existing sources. Um, and meanwhile, climate change, which affects maritime Asia in particular, uh, will create additional demands in terms of infrastructure. My basic point here is that there is tremendous demand in, in Southeast Asia uh, in response to some of the initiatives that China is putting forward. My second uh, point is to simply say is that despite that interest, and there is broad interest across the board in Southeast Asia, that there are concerns and risks. Um, Southeast Asian states are extremely concerned about the perceived uh, US retrenchment, for example, and disengagement. Um, and they're especially concerned about over-reliance on any one partner, and that's historically been the case, not just in terms of China, but certainly China raises a lot of questions currently. And then my third and final point is simply to say that there, that means that there are opportunities for the United States to engage the region on this front, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I think that we also have to be clear-eyed, I think, about what we're able to do. Again, only 5% of those infrastructure needs are being met. Um, and so um, the United States has put forward some important proposals, um, uh, but given our own political and material constraints, I think um, we also need to think more broadly about how to engage those, those needs as well as serve our own interests. Thanks. Senator Coons, you've just returned from a, a trip to the area, Japan, Korea, China. And I'm wondering whether you see opportunities for the U.S. to pursue work in collaboration with China to address our concerns, but also significant developmental needs in developing Asian and, and African countries, um, as well as thinking about China's own developmental insecurities. Can we address our own national security concerns while we're doing this? Well, that's three different questions. Yeah, Let me see I know, if I can touch I on each in order I a bunch out there, quickly. I know. <laughs> um, I was in Beijing during the Belt and Road uh, Forum, and it was striking to me. This is the second, uh, but second annual and likely to be first of many. There were at least 40 heads of state uh, who came to participate. It was very well produced. It was very well attended, uh, and it is a very ambitious um, economic development and uh, projection of power initiative by the People's Republic of China. Um, I do think it's possible that we could cooperate. Um, while there, I met with the head of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, a relatively new multilateral institution that a number of our G7 partners are also participating in. Um, and there's a key difference here. One of the core criticisms of Belt and Road projects, those that have already been done, is a lack of transparency, mm -hmm. uh, lack of a real um, development outcome, and then a concern about the possibility of debt traps, meaning these projects end up being terribly costly, 
and then end up compromising the sovereignty of the countries in which they're done. Um, those are broad critiques of BRI projects that the United States and many others have leveled, and President Xi Jinping responded to that directly uh, in his opening remarks at the Belt and Road Forum. Um, the head of the AAIB insisted that they are intending to function according to international standards, uh, to only finance development projects that are done transparently uh, with good labor and environmental metrics um, and in ways that actually serve the needs of the people in the countries in which they're uh, being done. As you mentioned, there is a huge need, uh, not just in Southeast Asia, but also, I mean, throughout the world, in the Middle East, in Africa, um, in uh, Central and South America, there are trillions of dollars of potential infrastructure and development projects that could be done. I am concerned about the tenor uh, of conversation in Congress and in Washington towards Belt and Road. It is being highlighted as a Belt, Road, and Cell Phone Tower uh, initiative that is seen as a way of sort of paving um, the uh, digital highway for Huawei and uh, China state security to dominate uh, the developing world. Um, that may be a little overblown. And frankly, the numbers may be a little overblown. Uh, while there have been uh, very breathless press releases about hundreds of billions of dollars of projects, um, there are, there's much fewer than that actually underway and actually on the ground. So to conclude, I do think it is possible for us to partner uh, with our allies in the region uh, and in Southeast Asia using the new development finance corporation that is the result of the BUILD Act uh, which a number of us worked on in the last Congress is now law and is strengthening America's tools in this area. I think it is possible for us to partner with the development finance uh, entities in South Korea, in Japan, in Australia, and elsewhere to demonstrate what a truly global development standard project looks like, and then to talk with the Chinese about modifying Belt and Road um, so that it actually meets the very aspirational standards that the head of the AAIB was laying out. There's more than enough need in the world. The United States has one of the deepest, most um, capable capital markets. Uh, we have an enormous amount of private capital that is looking for investment opportunities in the developing world. Um, our new development finance corporation really could lead a multilateral effort to not just raise the standards of development, uh, but to also engage China in a constructive and collaborative way um, in lifting uh, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and modernizing their infrastructure in dozens of countries, just as China has done within its own country. So we're, we're obviously here at a university, and many universities, including the University of Delaware, are seeking to build relationships with Chinese educational institutions, providing significant opportunities for Chinese scholars to come to the U.S. and for U.S. scholars to lecture there. Student exchanges have been developed as well. We're doing some really interesting things here in our department, the Department of Sociology and some other areas. I've been told by counterparts at Chinese universities, in fact, there's often a mandate that professors go abroad in order to be promoted. So they're, they're really pushing outward in that sense. And the long-term benefits to having Chinese academics experience the American educational, cultural, political environment seem fairly clear to me. At the same time, there are clearly legitimate concerns about the potential for spying, particularly for intellectual property theft, and that perhaps not every Chinese scholar visiting the United States is really doing so as a scholar. So I'm going to turn to Professor Wang and ask, you arrived in the US as a young scholar to work on your PhD because of the reputation in the US among your teachers. All right, you've noted that Chinese scholars in the US have served as a good and often unofficial channel for communications between the two sides. Um, you also have noted that since the 1980s, these scholars who come here and go back may be the most substantial implicit ally that we could have in authoritarian China. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit more about how Chinese intellectuals and elites have viewed the US, particularly in recent years, and whether the perspectives that you felt from your teachers are now changing because of circumstances. Sure, thank you, David. As you noted, in this current ongoing the US-China conflict, more and more Chinese scholars, especially my colleagues who teach in Chinese university back in China, they have uh, noticed that an uh, increasing number of Chinese scholars, visiting scholars' visas have been either constrained or directly canceled. So that also caused, it had already caused a ripple effect, and we can see that point pretty clear now. So to me, I think my generation, my advisor generation, the majority of Chinese intellectuals 
their perception about the United States, their perception about the bilateral relationship had been quite positive, uh, especially after 1989, the Tiananmen event. So, but the current situation changing. I have to say that the majority of my friends, uh, they're still positive about the situation and they regard the current conflict as a short-lived and can be abnormal. But at the same time, they do have a great concern over this uh, scenario in which confrontation can replace friendship and confrontation will become normal. And the US might gradually close its door to the Chinese intellectuals. And nobody wants that to happen. But many friends of mine, they seem that they believe this policy is being established. So exactly on that part, I want to hear our senators' comments. Because I see them as good channels as the bilateral, uh, the channels of bilateral contacts. So they can provide us with many things that are beyond official rhetoric along the official lines. Thank and I, and I, I wonder how we address this, right? The benefits of having this kind of intellectual exchange, but the risks to the United States national security when we know that in fact, at least in some cases, there's more than meets the eye. First, um, my approach towards US-China relations uh, begins with humility. Uh, I think the United States uh, as a culture and a country needs to recognize that we have a lot to learn. Um, that while there are, I think, 325,000 uh, Chinese students and scholars in the United States, roughly, uh, there's something like 10% of that in Americans who are in China. Right. Um, our own uh, governor, Jack Markell, um, launched uh, Mandarin education in our public schools. I just happened to have uh, an intern in my office uh, last week when I met with the ambassador from China, um, and he speaks Mandarin because of uh, going to Conrad High School here. Um, so I think we can be proud of having had state leadership that recognized um, the value, um, the, the validity of a need for Americans to better study, better understand, uh, better connect with um, China's culture, which is deep, um, complex, and ancient. Uh, I am very concerned, second, um, that what I'm hearing in my colleagues in Congress, uh, we are casually sliding towards uh, a genuine confrontation with China and the framework, the frame of reference being used uh, is our Cold War conflict with the Soviet Union. Um, the PRC and the Soviet Union are fundamentally different. We are in a different place in terms of our inter interconnected economies. We're in a different place in terms of the academic, intellectual, and cultural exchanges that have happened uh, over our 40 years of uh, open diplomatic relations. And we're in a different place in terms of China's strength and role and trajectory in the world um, than what the Soviet Union ever was. So I'm very concerned that we're approaching this with the wrong attitude and the wrong mindset. Uh, and frankly, as a result, I'm concerned that we in the United States are very ill-prepared um, for if a conflict should come, um, what we would be preparing for and what it would look like. Um, so last, um, I think that Chinese students and scholars in the United States play an absolutely central role in continuing um, to strengthen and nurture um, the, this vibrant culture-to-culture um, -culture intellectual uh, exchange and relationship. Um, I have had some briefings that have led to real concern about the role of state security um, in the current generation of students and scholars. Um, I do think uh, under Xi Jinping and the current leadership of China, there's been a, a turn um, towards a somewhat heavier hand by um, government in terms of what they're asking of students and scholars. And I frankly think we need to be very careful in the United States um, to not play into um, really truly regrettable uh, nativist or racist stereotypes, to not um, over-criminalize um, the few investigations that may be appropriate or necessary of scholars. There have been some really tragic cases, very badly handled, uh, that have sent ripples of fear and concern uh, in the academic community here in the United States um, that I've been made well aware of. Um, universities are not adept at addressing national security and intelligence issues. That is not the background of most heads of most departments not is, you know, someone sends you an interesting paper, says they want to come be a visiting professor, yeah. wants to participate. Uh, how are you supposed to know um, this person's background? How are you supposed to be fully prepared to do relevant vetting? So I think um, the federal government, our intelligence community has to step up to this role. These conversations have to be held very carefully um, because I think there is very real risk 
of lasting harm. Um, the United States has a well-deserved reputation in China for being an open and welcoming society um, that although young, uh, is uh, vibrant. Um, and I really think the possibilities of partnership with China, the ways in which we really could team up to tackle the greatest challenges of this century, from climate change to pandemics, from nuclear proliferation to more resilient and sustainable infrastructure, there's enormous promise there. And we need to be careful that we don't casually push that aside and barrel towards conflict without really reflecting on the costs and consequences for the whole world should that happen. So, so you get a sense there are multiple issues, of course, between the US and China, multiple things that we're concerned about. And we're touching very briefly on just a couple of them here. Um, I, I'm going to switch again now to the, the question of fentanyl trafficking. Senator Coons, I know that this is something that you spent some time talking about in China and meeting with people in China mm -hmm. about it. And I also know that um, uh, China announced a ban Mm -hmm. But there are questions about the actual implementation of that ban mm -hmm. and, and how well it's going to be mm -hmm. uh, uh, monitored. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you could tell us a bit more about what you've learned, what right. you think the situation is. Um, first, let's just be clear what fentanyl is. Um, it is um, an incredibly powerful um, uh, compound, um, I think developed as a horse tranquilizer initially, um, that is being uh, used mixed with uh, opioids, heroin, uh, and other addictive substances um, with tragic impact. Um, I think something like 60% of the overdose deaths in Delaware um, in the last two years were related to fentanyl. Um, it gives a cheap, powerful, additional kick, as if heroin wasn't powerful and addictive enough. Um, and a, a significant amount of the fentanyl that is coming into the United States is coming in through Mexico or directly through China. Um, China does not have a fentanyl abuse problem, anything like the United States. Uh, and so uh, I was traveling with Senator Maggie Hassan. She represents New Hampshire. West Virginia and New Hampshire are the two states in the United States most decimated. Um, but Delaware, frankly, also um, is really struggling with this. We had 38 Delawareans die in the 31 days of August last year, um, just to give you a sense of number. In a very small state like ours, um, to have more than 350 people a year dying from um, opioid overdoses is quite something. Um, we first have a responsibility to get our own house in order, to deal with the demand side, to provide uh, the treatment, the interdiction, the public health response in the United States that is appropriate. Um, second, in the meetings I had with, uh, I think it was the National Counter Narcotics uh, Center, uh, this was in the Ministry of Public Safety um, in Beijing, um, Senator Hassan and I expressed our gratitude um, to the initiative taken uh, by China to list fentanyl and some of its precursors and components, which means making them illegal. Um, and then taking, uh, we hope, um, very strong steps to enforce that listing. Um, it, it is something that has a significant negative impact uh, on America's perception of China. Um, there have been some legislative initiatives in Congress that uh, I hope will now um, slow down or change course to recognize this positive step uh, by China and that we could work in partnership uh, to try and slow um, the flood of uh, fentanyl coming into our country. You know, part of what's happening here is the way in which modern trade is so different. Trade of 10 or 20 years ago was whole container loads moving from a manufacturing plant uh, onto a ship and then um, to a dock and then to a receiving factory. Today, there are literally millions of packages, tiny packages, uh, being shipped directly from small producers um, to small consumers. Uh, and we haven't developed the systems yet with our postal service, uh, with our uh, Customs and Border Patrol, um, although we have passed the legislation to do so, uh, and Senator Hassan played a central role in that. Uh, last, le let me just remind you, um, there was a tragic chapter uh, in Chinese history where uh, Western powers um, really pushed opium and opium addiction um, into China in a way that was profoundly debilitating. Um, modern Chinese leaders are well aware uh, of this a very difficult um, chapter uh, in China's relations with the West. Uh, as a state, China is very aggressively opposed uh, to narcotics, uh, and I think can and, and will be a good partner in working with us. Uh, and I think we've moved past a period where there was a lot of finger wagging on both sides. You know, this is your domestic problem. No, this is your problem. Uh, and I'm very optimistic now that uh, having taken this strong step, 
the United States and China will together do more to tackle um, this very real challenge that is affecting the people of Delaware and the entire United States. So in, in a very brief last minute or two here, I'm, I'm going to turn to our, our academic colleagues uh, and just ask each of you very briefly to give us some sense of what you think are, are critical issues that China and um, other countries in the area or China and Taiwan, some very, sadly, some very brief sense of that, if you could. Professor Bob? Um, no. Sure. I mean, I think the, the biggest challenge, I think, has to do with U.S.-China relations in Asia, as far as I'm concerned. And I, I'm very heartened, actually, to hear from Senator Coons that there are these avenues for cooperation on various fronts. You know, um, and I'm going to just be very brief, but, you know, I've been part of a three-year dialogue between you, a, a small group of U.S. and China scholars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's been real concern that dialogue mechanisms are being cut off, are. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, when we have tensions, our response is to cut off talks, right. you know? I mean, that's ridiculous. So I'm, I'm very heartened to hear that. So I'll just leave it at that. Professor, Professor Wong, some final thoughts generally? Yeah, I would say U.S. and China can cooperate in sort of a couple of very important issues next to China, mainland China. One is North Korea, another is Taiwan. So I think this is a cooperation, to me, is the only way that we can find. It's very brief. Okay, it was very <laughs> brief. Well, thanks. I believe our time is up for this panel, but there's much more still coming. Thanks to the panelists for being here and giving these important insights. And thanks to you in the audience for taking your time, particularly for those of you from the university at the end of a very busy academic year. We'll take a brief moment to set things up for the second part of the program, featuring Senator Coons and former National Security Advisor Tom Donilon. Please stay tuned for part two. Please thank them for their contributions to our first panel. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. So we're going to do a very quick reset of the stage here. So stay, stay put. And as we do so, you will see that we will also be viewing a continuation of the bio that we uh, heard from Provost Morgan for our keynote guest in the second half of our program. And that is coming up as soon as uh, we have everything all set and ready to go. We will continue the conversation. One of the things that we are pleased about is that we are able to offer you both the primer on the topic with the academics from the University of Delaware and now have the opportunity to hear from two insiders, being the senator, and also Tom Donilon, who is the former national security advisor. He was security advisor during the Obama administration. And uh, you can see some of the tweets that were from the senator's recent tour of East Asia and China. So gentlemen, I want to welcome both of you to our stage, and we will continue the conversation and learn so much more. Thank you all so much. I, I want to thank Nancy uh, for the introduction. Some of you may know that she was the moderator for a little debate that happened right here in 2010 <laughs> that uh, was truly uh, delightful. Um, I've known uh, Tom Donilon, uh, I think, 30 years uh, since uh, I had the great joy of being a summer associate at the law firm of Melvin and Myers, where he was a practicing partner. Um, and he is the most brilliant brief writer I've literally ever met, uh, and also a very capable and insightful leader uh, in politics, in national security, uh, in foreign policy matters. Uh, you got a brief introduction to his uh, biography, but I am genuinely thrilled, Tom, that you were willing to make some time for us uh, here at the university. Uh, Tom has a long and close relationship with our former vice president, uh, and this is an editorial comment on my part, I hope our next president. Um, and I think having his insights on this most important area uh, is really critical. Um, I took a week in East Asia um, before launching back into this coming uh, 18 months because I think the U.S.-China relationship is the foundational relationship for this century. But I'm a newcomer to this. Tom was giving um, really central, important speeches on U.S.-China relations and the United States and East Asia, um, I think in 2011, 2013, 2015, and played a central role uh, in the Obama-Biden administration's policies. So, Tom, why don't you kick us off uh, by bringing us up to date. Um, you gave very thoughtful, very well-grounded speeches um, that I relied on in preparing uh, to go to East Asia. How have things changed? How does the field look different today 
um, as we head into, barrel into, careen into the second year of the Trump administration. Thank you. Senator, it's great to be here and great to be here with everybody uh, this morning. Uh, Delaware is fortunate in its senator, uh, who is, I think, rightfully seen as one of the most thoughtful senators uh, serving today uh, in a whole range of areas, right, but foreign policy as well as, as well as the Judiciary Committee and the challenges that we've had in that, uh, uh, in that area. We've been really one of the most thoughtful leaders that we, that we have. Uh, my brother Michael, my younger brother, actually teaches here. Uh, and is the director of the Biden Center uh, mm -hmm. on campus at the University of Delaware. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, on China, I think you're exactly right. I think that uh, U.S.-China relations will be the most important challenge for U.S. diplomats and policymakers, and uh, for the, for as far as the eye can see, and it's the most important relationship in the world right now, bar mm -hmm. none, uh, given uh, the geopolitical, the military, and the economic interactions uh, between the United States and uh, and China. I think that you know, we, uh, as you referenced in the Obama administration, we came into office in 2008, and during the transition, President Obama asked a question. Uh, how are we doing on our footprint in the world? Uh, where are we underweighted and where are we overweighted in the world? And the conclusion we had during the course of the transition in 2008 into 2009 was that we were significantly underweighted in terms of our attention to Asia across almost every dimension. Uh, whether it be diplomatic or military, mind share, um, uh, and economic. Um, and we decided to engage in a rebalance, right, both in terms of the attention that we pay to the region and the resources that we allocated uh, uh, to the region. Uh, difficult to do because we were also in the midst of uh, uh, wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq and, in, and also running the most aggressive anti-terror effort that the country had ever, uh, had ever run. So, but I think we made a lot of progress on it. Um, uh, moving, uh, moving, uh, moving forward. Where are we today? Directly to your question. I think that, and we can debate this. I'll lay out a proposition. And see if you agree. Um, uh, I think when we look back on 2018, that it'll be seen as the year when U.S. policy, as articulated by the United States government today, and I think agreed, of course, a lot of across the bipartisan uh, a group of institutions uh, and, and organizations. 2018 will be the year when the United States policy moved from one of strategic cooperation, mm -hmm. really which had its roots in Richard Nixon's trip to uh, Beijing in February of 1972, uh, right through uh, every president since then, and will be seen more as moving to a strategic competition model. I think that's where, I think that when we look back on 2018, I think that's what we'll, that's what we'll think about where the U.S.-China uh, policy uh, has, uh, 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 has gone. I think the relationship has changed more uh, it's in the process of changing uh, to a greater, ex greater extent. There's been more changes than we've really seen since the late 1970s when yeah. China opened its economy for the first time and began to open it to the world and when the United States established formal relations with China in, 19, in 1979. There are a lot of reasons for this. Uh, some are natural, uh, uh, you know, as, uh, with a rising power, you know, uh, challenging a, uh, uh, an existing power. We've seen that through, uh, through history. Some of it has to do with President Xi's approach. Um, which is more aggressive both domestically and internationally. Uh, the old Deng Xiaoping saying of mm -hmm. China should hide its time and bide its capabilities is, uh, as we would say in politics here, no longer operative, right, in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in China. Third, I think it's interesting that the story we told ourselves about China, mm -hmm. which was that as China became richer, it would become more democratic in its political mm -hmm. institutions, this turned out not to be true. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, the current leadership of China uh, has as its highest priority the maintenance of the monopoly power of the Communist Party of China over the society in every dimension, increasingly. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that. I thought, mm -hmm. We can talk about some of the human rights aspects of that, right? Mm -hmm. But in every dimension. Uh, and they see that as a superior system for mm -hmm. the development of China uh, and see it as a system that's, that's really delivered one of the great economic stories um, uh, in history. And I think the last thing that's happened is the United States withdrawing to some extent, particularly over the last couple of years. Uh, and China has moved to fill that vacuum. I think that's happened earlier and faster than they expected. So I'll finish up by saying I think that's caused a significant rethink, don't you think, on U.S.-China relations in the United mm -hmm. States? And it includes Republicans, Democrats. It includes the intelligence community, the military, mm -hmm. the Congress, business, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, NGOs who are interested in uh, values uh, issues. And it's seen most directly in trade, but I don't think that's the main game. Uh, over the long term, and I'll finish up on this. I think this is a more strategic set of competitions. Um, 
tech, again, ac economics is front and center because of the trade uh, conversation and, and negotiations that the president has launched. A trade negotiation, by the way, is not a strategy for Asia. Right. Uh, that's, a, that's at best a piece of a strategy for, uh, uh, for, uh, for Asia. It's a much broader thing. And we have really significant issues like who's going to have the commanding heights in terms of uh, technology leadership uh, in mm -hmm. the world. And the last thing I'll say is this about it, which is your point in the earlier conversation, Senator, I think is exactly right. Uh, it is easy to point to, and these are important issues, the rivalry aspects of this. Um, we have to be careful that it not squeeze out any discussion of the cooperative aspects which mm -hmm. are necessary going forward. Mm -hmm. So that would be my summary mm -hmm. of where I think we, we are. Can we give a round of applause, Tom, for a really remarkable, quick mm -hmm. survey of a very broad range of topics? Uh, let's start small and then work our way big. Um, yeah. It's small, but it's important. Um, you know, President Trump tweeted um, the, a threat to raise 25% yeah. uh, tariffs on another $325 billion in American goods, a cost, uh, he keeps misdescribing it as uh, tariffs that are paid into America's coffers, when in fact these are costs borne by American companies and American consumers. Um, it's a bold move. Um, he ran on being an unconventional president, and he has certainly overperformed in that category. Yeah. Um, True. And uh, so mm -hmm. I'll ask a question about trade, but put it in a context. Mm -hmm. um, I traveled uh, with a delegation uh, led by Senator McCain to Singapore uh, to the Shangri-La Conference uh, in early 2017. Um, and it was part of um, a series of security conferences I went to. It was striking how many of our vital allies in the region were concerned, as you say, about our retreat. Mm -hmm. It was that exact day um, that President Trump withdrew us from the Paris a climate uh, agreement. So there's a whole series of multilateral agreements that the Obama-Biden administration put in place, whether it's the JCPOA uh, to constrain Iran's uh, illicit nuclear weapons mm -hmm. program and the threat that Iran poses, or it was the Paris climate talks. President Trump has switched from a multilateral strategy to a bilateral strategy. And I think you can reasonably debate which is better. I'm a Democrat, I like multilateral, I like friends and allies, I think that's important. Um, but it's not necessarily a bad idea to pursue bilateral strategies. Mm -hmm. Where I'm concerned it's had real consequences is the ways in which we have retreated on human rights, on the things that make our system different, I think, and admirably so, um, and in the reduction um, from a menu of things that makes America special to just a narrow um, index of interests. The national security strategy talks about the renewal of great power competition, even confrontation, where it's really seen as a zero-sum game of interests. What do you think is the best possible outcome of the current trade conflict with China? What would a good deal look like? Yeah. What would a good deal be that um, Democrats and Republicans in Congress should cheer and that business should be satisfied with, and what's really possible out of that, A. B, how much lasting damage do you think has been done to our core alliances with countries like Canada, Germany, the UK, um, South Korea, Japan, who have complained pointedly and bitterly that President Trump imposed national security justified tariffs on some of our closest allies, and then see what sort of advice would you have for a future administration about multilateral versus bilateral mechanisms? I don't think the next chapter in American history is as easy as throwing the switch back no. to the approach um, that Obama took. I think it'll take a new strategy. What should it look like? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a uh, okay. I can ask good well, questions. Yeah, well, let's start right now. <laughs> I don't have any answers, just good questions. <laughs> yeah. I'll try to address a couple of those things. And I, I want to come back to get your sense of the current reaction to U.S. policy in the region, because you've mm -hmm. just been there a, a, week, a week ago. Um, so on um, uh, the current trade negotiation, um, the president has brought trade front and center in his foreign policy. Mm -hmm. You know, he's the first president we've had with no elected political experience okay. and no military experience. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have views. Uh, and, he's had, <laughs> and he's had views on trade for a long time, yeah. uh, uh, since, the, since the 1980s, and his view has been that uh, the United States has taken the, uh, has gotten the, the kind of the raw end of the deal, basically, mm -hmm. on trade, uh, on trade um, negotiations and trade agreements. And he's uh, been opposed to them, obviously, he's trying to undo them. His view is um, essentially a zero-sum view, which is that if you have a trade deficit with a country, 
uh, you are a loser. If you have a trade surplus, you're a winner. Now, there are no economists that I know of who actually view that and has a strange view of tariffs. Uh, you saw it in the tweets last night when the president threatened the, the additional uh, tariff percent, tariff tax, taxes essentially on uh, Chinese imports. He asserted that China was paying those, uh, those, those, those tariffs, those taxes uh, into the U.S. Treasury. And of course, that's just not correct. Uh, you know, the tariffs are paid by the importing U.S. company and ultimately by the U.S. consumer uh, in the uh, in the United States. So there's a, there are some fundamentals. Uh, uh, you know, essentially, you have a kind of a uh, a very old economic view trying to solve some 21st century problems. That's the first, mm -hmm. that's the first thing. So what would a good trade deal look like? It would be good to have more reciprocity. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt, and if Hillary Clinton had got elected president or Donald Trump as the president, either was going to have to deal with this. Uh, yeah. We had had a series of economic disputes with China that were, that were building up uh, over the years and needed to be addressed. And they really are fundamentally around fairness and reciprocity, that a U.S. company or another foreign company doing business in China should be treated as well as a Chinese company doing business in the United States, and that's not the case. So right. I think progress on that would be, a, would be an important thing, uh, an important thing to do. Um, and then there are the enforcement mechanisms uh, that, uh, that are important, and I think the Congress obviously will take a close look and see if this is real, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then I think the President's interested in it because he has this theory about deficits and surpluses, he'll be interested in large purchases from uh, uh, from China, and we'll have to see how it all how it all fits how it all fits together. My own view uh, is that intensive bilateral negotiation should have been accompanied by a multilateral mm -hmm. layer. Framework. Right? Work, we would have we will have more success working with allies and markets that the Chinese need to change Chinese conduct than we will just in a bilateral uh, bilateral setting. Um, this rejection. Of, of, of multilateral trade negotiations also means that we're going to be disadvantaged. We already are. You mm -hmm. know, there's a, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was a multilateral trade negotiation that the Obama administration completed, including about 12 countries and about 70 percent of world trade. Um, the president rejected, in line with rejecting the Paris Accord, the Iranian deal. This trade the trans Pacific Partnership was also rejected. Well, that the, the other 11 countries. Right. So we're going ahead, and you yep. were just in. You were just in, uh, Asia, and you saw that. We're going ahead. That puts U.S. companies at a, at a disadvantage because there's no tariffs among those countries, and our companies have to pay right. the tariffs. It would have been much better to go ahead uh, with multilateral efforts to get China to change its uh, uh, to uh, uh, to change its uh, policy. So that's on, on the trade though. But the um, and to, to two other aspects of your question, um, uh, which is the price that's been paid for this approach. That is a really, really important question. It doesn't get enough attention, I think. So we, uh, for example, spent uh, over a year, the United States government really pressuring Canada and Mexico over a revision of the NAFTA agreement. Mm -hmm. The NAFTA agreement was ready to be updated, and I think Canada and Mexico are prepared to update it. But the president entered into kind of an all-out assault uh, on these countries to get what is essentially very modest changes. Yep. So let's, let me see if I can quantify the price. Modest changes in the agreement but if you look at polling data, for example, in Mexico, in the end of 19, uh, 2016, if you ask the Mexican public, do you have confidence that the U.S. president will do the right thing? Mm -hmm. right? It was at 60 percent or so. Uh, and, that, and that's pretty high given the history between the United States and Mexico over the last 100 years. Right? Today, that, that number is 5 percent. Five. Yes. And that's real damage. And it was, wow. and it's on my own, my own judgment. Again, you know, it's easier to, to kind of throw criticisms from outside. I've been inside long enough to know that, right? But this has been real damage. So if you look at the cost-benefit analysis, I think, I think we'll see a similarly kind of high cost for what we, wherever we get in the trade, uh, trade uh, uh, deal in um, China. The last piece I'll say on this is the piece that nobody's really discussing is um, we have this discussion about China focused on trade, and we're really hyper-focused on trying to change their conduct. Mm -hmm. Right? And we have, will have limits on our ability to change Chinese conduct. Some of this is, is, is what the Chinese development system looks like. Mm -hmm. Some of it is bad behavior, and it's going to be difficult to change, but we should try. And I'll be positive to the extent we can. But we're not asking ourselves what we need to do. Yeah. That, it seems to me, Senator, is kind of the missing piece of the China strategy thus far. Mm -hmm. What is the United States going to do to meet the competitive, the, co the competition? And, and it's real competition. Now, you know, this theory that somehow China um, you know, it's just the copying things, and uh, yeah. that's not where Chinese development is right now, as you, as, as you know. And I think that that's a question to ask ourselves. Where are we investing? Where are we in terms of our own research and development? The budget the president put out uh, in February, right, has a 5% overall reduction in R&D, and we've had a tr tremendously negative kind of path on our research and development like this right over the last over a decade. 
Um, and he had a 13, 15% cut at the Sci National Science Foundation, which is a lot of this basic stuff happens. Uh, we had a $2 trillion tax cut that we uh, passed last year. Not a single discussion that I know of investments associated with it, like infrastructure and things, uh, and things like that. We need to focus on science. So that, that's a, kind of a, a, my answer to kind of the, some of the key questions that you asked. What are we, what are we doing right, in order to meet this challenge? Because we will only be able to change this conduct in other countries uh, only so much, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, in fact, I, I just published an editorial, I think maybe 10 days ago, in which uh, my argument was um, there is this emerging conflict, there is this emerging competition uh, between our models. Um, for most of the last four decades, uh, China was pursuing its own domestic development and making a, just astonishing accomplishments. They've lifted more than 500 million people out of poverty. Uh, I hadn't been in China in 25 years, mm. and I was stunned. Yeah. Uh, at the scope and reach and complexity of their economic development. You can read about it, but it's entirely another thing uh, to be you know, arriving in a state-of-the-art modern airport and whisked along on a highway that looks newer and better than any highway in the United States and to see building after building after building that looks as if it was just built because it was. Um, we went uh, to Hangzhou to visit um, Alibaba mm -hmm. and Jack Ma, who's a fairly well-known entrepreneur, one of the richest men in China. Um, and he, they put on a really impressive display about um, the companies that he's launched that are essentially the Chinese equivalents, roughly, of eBay and Amazon, but with 750 million customers internally and with uh, intentions to grow externally. We need to stop thinking about the rise of China and China as a future competitor. And Ch they, are, they are here. They have arrived. Um, last year was a year where there were as many patents filed in China as in the United States, as many peer-reviewed scientific uh, articles published in China as the United States. You could quibble about quality, uh, but frankly, uh, the number of engineering students, the number of inventors and innovators, the amount of invention being done, uh, China is our competitor, a peer competitor. Your point about how much are we investing is the central run. Um, as many of you know, I see Dr. Reardon's here, um, I am a fierce advocate on the Appropriations Committee for strengthening how much we're investing in NIH and the National Science Foundation, in this amazing constellation of national laboratories we have, and in particular in the Manufacturing USA strategy that led uh, to Nimble being uh, headquartered here at the Star Campus of the University of Delaware. We need to double down our investment uh, in next generation technologies, in things from communications uh, to clean power um, to how we're gonna build out the next generation of infrastructure for the world. If we wanna compete, the first thing we ought to do uh, is invest in our own capabilities to be able to compete. One of the concerns many have identified strategically is that in parts of the world like Africa, uh, where there is development underway and where democracy after a decade of great advances seems to be somewhat on the back foot, um, China is now exporting not just uh, manufactured goods, um, but its model and is beginning to offer um, the tools and the means of state surveillance uh, to monitor, manage, and control populations. Um, to put it positively, China's view is um, they have a principle of non-interference in the domestic affairs of other countries. Um, and they will go to African heads of state and say, do you really think the United States has the right to ask about how you treat your press, uh, your minority political parties, uh, your own environment? Uh, don't you think they should respect your sovereignty and stay out of those issues? Uh, and I frankly think that our commitment to promoting democracy and open societies is a lot of what has won us a global constellation of allies. Uh, not customers, not client states, not nervous neighbors, but genuine allies based on shared values. Um, I think there are millions of people trying to get into the United States because of our deserved reputation as an open society, uh, which I don't think um, is the parallel in China. Uh, but we have to think about this competition in models. And to your point, Tom, the best way for democracy to be a more appealing model is for our own democracy to work. We shut down about half of the federal government of the United States for 35 days in a largely pointless fight over the difference between border fence and border wall at the end of last year. If you're in a developing country and China shows up and says, here's our model for lifting people out of poverty and for running a society, what about our current conduct in Congress and in Washington seems admirable, seems uplifting, seems like the sort of model uh, you should yeah. follow. 
This is why I'll come back to human rights and what role human rights um, ought to play in our role on the world stage. Um, I've been struck at the number of people I've met around the world who listened to Voice of America um, and heard the call, not just of American jazz, although that seems to be enormously influential, um, not just American culture, uh, our music and our, and our conduct towards each other, uh, but who were drawn by the idea of liberty, the idea of being able to live your life as you see fit uh, and to carry out uh, God's gifts to you in the way that you would pursue. We had lunch with North Korean defectors when we were in Seoul and to meet with people who had literally risked their lives repeatedly in order to leave um, the gulag of North Korea and make it through China into South Korea or into the, uh, into the broader region and were now dedicating their lives to trying to help others get out of North Korea it was really inspiring. What role do you think, Tom, um, human rights ought to play um, I really think it has um, gone down the list in terms of priorities. Yeah. It does upset um, the Chinese when we raise issues like the Uyghurs, uh, when we raise internal issues like the treatment of uh, Falun Gong or Tibet, um, and they do resent uh, our raising questions about internal matters. Um, how do you think we ought to strike this balance in terms of the strategic priority of cooperation yeah. mm -hmm. and structured competition versus continuing to press the very thing that makes us an admired world leader. Yeah, I think you had it exactly right. I mean, it, it, it seems to me, you know, we, we talk about the decoupling of the tech sectors, right, in this, in this uh, economic uh, competition that we're in with, uh, with China. And there is some decoupling that's going to go on because we are going to, we are going to, as you had discussed in the earlier panel, there are, tough, there are tough questions around this, particularly for universities. But we do have to protect our intellectual property and be mm -hmm. smart about how we uh, about how we do it, and um, we do have threats against our companies and against our, uh, our, our intellectual property and other, and other assets, so we have to, there may be some decoupling there, but it seems to me the broader decoupling that's going on in the world is the one you described, which is really um, a competition between governance systems mm -hmm. uh, where you have state-centric authoritarian uh, nations with their approach to governance um, and liberal democratic nations with, with our approach to governance. Mm -hmm. um, We've had a lot of pressure on the democracies, frankly, yeah. uh, uh, particularly since the financial financial crisis, and the performance of the democracies is really going to be critical going forward here. I think um, uh, because I do think that at the end of the day, it's the most attractive system. It's the place where people want to uh, mm -hmm. want to uh, uh, want to live and, and raise their families and uh, and thrive. An essential part of that competition, though, is not to give up the values asset that we have, mm -hmm. and it seems to me that. Um, I think, as you were saying, we have, we've, we have, that's a tremendous strength. I mean, one of the great, as, I, as you talked earlier, you know, that um, it's a real mistake for the United States to portray itself as just another nation. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not just another nation, and our, our style of leadership, particularly since World War II, has been distinct. Mm -hmm. And it's been, it has been focused on win-win solutions. Mm -hmm. It's been focused on, um, hasn't been focused on um, you know, conquering or, uh, or um, winner-take-all uh, solutions, uh, public goods, um, mm -hmm. and the ideals that we've represented have been tr tremendously in our interest, ultimately, uh, over the last over half, a, over half a century. And it seems to me we don't talk about it enough and we're giving it away. Mm -hmm. To the extent that we don't use values as part of our foreign policy, to the extent we don't use values as something that brings us together in terms of our alliances and partnerships around the world, we are missing, don't you think, a real strength and asset, and, we, and today, it is nowhere to be found in American foreign policy, as best I can tell. Um, Th that is, Tom, one area where I think there's real bipartisanship in Congress mm -hmm. uh, in pushing back on the ways in which the current administration has really reduced um, the visibility, the forcefulness of its advocacy mm -hmm. on human rights. I'm the co-chair of the Human Rights Caucus in the mm -hmm. Senate with Senator Tillis of North Carolina. Uh, we're in the midst of an effort to rename that after John McCain, uh, in no small part because I think the most admirable part of his long record of service uh, was the ways in which he advocated um, for human rights, um, you know, particularly um, in advocating against the use of torture in yeah. the treatment of de detainees based on his own experience right. as a POW, um, among many other things that he worked on. I do think, as you put it, remembering what makes us exceptional, remembering what makes us um, an extraordinary and a unique country in world history, um, is I think one of our greatest strengths and something that we walk away from um, at our own peril. And the other systems that are kind of emerging right now are really, again, 
Um, you know, you, you spend time with foreign leaders. I spend an enormous amount of time in China talking to leaders about it. And yeah, there's, a, there's an argument that get made about why their system is right for their country. But it's interesting, mm -hmm. that system, which as I said at the top of the remarks really is, in China at least, really is driven by the imperative for the maintenance of the of monopoly power by increased monopoly power, by the con and continued monopoly power by the Communist Party of China in every aspect of life, is now being uh, enhanced and enabled by technology, mm -hmm. and that's becoming. That's it's interesting. That's becoming. That's becoming an export. Mm -hmm. uh, that system. Don't you think you see it around mm -hmm. around the world, where basically you know the, the technology which allows uh, a nation state mm -hmm. to essentially monitor vast numbers of people. Mm -hmm. uh, through uh, uh, facial recognition and mm -hmm. uh, data mining and you know, powered by automated intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, right? Uh, it makes these nations very powerful, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, uh, they're, it's sold as a way to maintain authority mm -hmm. and power and to keep out bad influences. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, I think you must see it around the world. Uh, it, 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 it's now becoming an export. I do, and one of the more challenging recent meetings I had was with uh, the president of Italy, uh, as, uh, as I suspect many uh, know, um, in the deployment of 5G, uh, which is the next generation uh, of wireless communication, um, the United States has picked a fairly pointed fight um, with China's uh, leading provider of uh, both the hardware and the systems for 5G, a company called Huawei. Uh, we've now insisted that we not procure Huawei components for anything that is part of um, the American telecommunications uh, infrastructure. Um, and we've pressed our key national security partners, uh, the so-called Five Eyes, uh, to follow our lead in this. Australia and New Zealand have agreed with us. The United Kingdom has not. Um, the United Kingdom just reached a conclusion that they think um, they can keep the core of um, the 5G communication system um, free of Chinese spying or interference, um, and that they, they don't see it the same way we do. Um, Italy has recently signed up for Belt and Road uh, and was represented at the Belt and Road Conference and also um, shares a skeptical view of our assessment of the security challenges posed uh, by 5G. Back to your core point, yeah. um, which I agree with, that the United States needs to get its own house in order and look mm -hmm. to our own conduct first. As I've talked to uh, allies and partners, Japan and South Korea, about this vital issue, one of the core questions is, is there a competitive offering that is comparably uh, integrated, robust, and ready for deployment, and that's cost competitive. I'll remind you, China subsidizes yeah. Huawei's offerings fairly significantly. Samsung of South Korea is the closest. Um, there are American companies that are trying out 5G deployments on a large scale in the United States, um, but in terms of building out the, the, the material, the network um, that makes the backbone of 5G possible, um, arguably Nokia, there's two Scandinavian companies and one um, Asian company, uh, Samsung, um, that are from countries with which we have close security partnerships. Um, this is, and forgive me for referencing back to the Cold War, I said earlier this is exactly the wrong frame of reference, yeah. but um, I don't have a more powerful metaphor than this. Uh, it is a Sputnik moment uh, for this generation, meaning a moment where we look and realize uh, that we have a competitor that is ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important piece of the Sputnik moment that I'm trying to reference is that we significantly increased investment in the United States in our own research capabilities, in our own education. American public education was refocused on being competitive uh, in the space age after Sputnik was launched. Um, and Russia continued to be ahead of us in the space race for a number of years. I was just at an event at the Library of Congress mm -hmm. um, celebrating the anniversary of the first landing on the moon um, and looking back on what made that possible. In some ways, I, I wanna, and I, I wanna leave you with this uh, image. Uh, I'd never heard of this incident before. Um, as Apollo 11, as the two astronauts of Apollo 11 who landed on the lunar surface were preparing to leave, uh, Neil Armstrong said, did you leave the package? Um, mm -hmm. And his colleague confirmed, yes, I've left the package, and then they took off. The package was a group of medals honoring the American astronauts who died in the space race, um, the three who were killed on the launch pad um, of an earlier Apollo mission mm -hmm. that blew up before it could take off, uh, as well as others. But there were also medals left behind honoring the Russian mm -hmm. cosmonauts who died in the space mm -hmm. race, in a recognition that that competition pushed both countries to be better than they otherwise mm -hmm. could have been. 
one of the questions I'll ask is whether competition between the United States and China must inevitably turn into conflict or whether we could avoid the so-called Thucydides trap and instead find ways that we order and structure our competition such that it is that, a vibrant competition, while emphasizing unexplored areas of cooperation. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Africa. I was chair of the Africa subcommittee my first four years and my friend Jeff Flake succeeded me. So Senator Flake and I took a number of trips uh, to Africa together. It is a continent of immense potential and it's got a lot of challenges where Chinese and American cooperation with our African partners uh, really could have an enormously positive impact. If instead we see China solely as our competitor, even a country with which we are in conflict for the loyalties of African client states, not my phrase, um, I think that is ultimately a negative mm -hmm. for the people of Africa as well as for the United States and China. Do you, Tom, think it is inevitable that we will end up in a military confrontation or in a conflict with China, or is it avoidable, and if so, how? Yeah, I don't think it's inevitable. You know, the Thucydides trap um, analysis has been uh, you know, put forth by Graham Allison, a friend yep. of ours up at Harvard University, and he analyzes 15 incidents over the last 1,500 years where you had an existing dominant power, read the United States in this case, and a rising power, read China, and Graham's analysis 12 out of the 15 times it ended in war. Uh, now the advantage that we have is we know that right. Uh, right, going forward, right, number one. And number two uh, is that we do have an awful lot in common at stake, I think, moving, uh, moving forward. You know, you're exactly right. This is not the Soviet Union in the Cold War. We, didn't have, we have a $600 plus billion dollar economic relationship between the United States and China. Mm -hmm. We have tens of thousands of people who go back and forth uh, uh, all the time. We have billions of dollars of investment in China. None of that existed with the Soviet Union. Right. Uh, so I think that we have to recognize the areas of competition. We have to, as a country, rise up to those. Uh, areas, but also, but, but also understand the really profound responsibility that leaders have in the United States and China, uh, not to have it descend into some sort of inevitable, inevitable conflict. You know, on the 5G point it makes, and I think it's a, it is a game-changing technology. It'll evolve, it's going to take a while, by the way. This is all not happening tomorrow, tomorrow, and there's various aspects to it as you, as you laid out. Um, but it's something we need to focus on as a, as a, as a country. And, and uh, and artificial intelligence more, uh, more, more, uh, more generally. You know, I think that these conversations with allies would go better if we had better relationships with our allies. Yes. I, 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 believe, I believe that. You know, we've had such an unnecessarily, we talked earlier about costs and benefits of various approaches, and you, know, you can have absolutely good goals, but the way you get there uh, matters, I think, in national security and foreign policy. And so um, we have had, um, Really, uh, and you're a frequent, you were a frequent attendee at the Munich Security Conference, um, our relations with our European allies are unnecessarily tough at this point, mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and it costs us. It costs us in these kinds of conversations because the conversation that we're having about 5G is this. We know they're going to underbid because they're subsidized. We know they have a significant installed bases on the 4G uh, mm -hmm. platforms in these countries. But there are real security long-term issues that you need to take into account and we need to work together on it. That conversation only really works if you're in a positive overall relationship, mm -hmm. I think, because you're asking people to sacrifice. Uh, uh, one last thing I'll say on the, on the, moon, on the moonshot, there is a book recommendation. Doug Brinkley, the historian yes. from, uh, from, from Texas, right, has a, um, is he at Texas? I don't know where he is, oh, Rice maybe. Uh, but Doug Brinkley, the historian, has a, has a terrific new book out called Moonshot, right? Mm -hmm. um, where he does the history of the space race and there's a really terrific uh, history of kind of the Sputnik moment and what it meant for the, mm -hmm. what it meant for the country. Mm -hmm. That's who was speaking at the Library of oh, Congress. Oh, right. so okay. okay. Listen, yeah. Listening Excellent. to you yeah. last week. Great. Um, let me, you asked me an earlier question yeah. I didn't quite answer, which was how are our allies responding in this yeah. current moment? Um, you know, one of the, the great joys of the work I get to do on your behalf is uh, I got to meet with uh, the foreign minister, the national security advisor, the finance minister, the defense minister in um, a mix of those uh, in both um, Japan and South Korea uh, and, uh, and Taiwan. Um, and in every country I've been to in the last two years um, that is a close ally of ours, uh, there's, uh, there's an anxiety, uh, there's a concern about where are you going really. Um, you pushed us so hard to come to the table for TPP and we made sacrifices and we put things on the table and we were ready to sign and then you walked away under a new administration. What does that mean? 
Um, so there are, there are bigger picture strategic questions about where is the United States in terms of our relationships. Then there's, there's also um, just anxiety about, frankly, President Trump's style. Um, he is unpredictable. Um, there is some concern that sitting across the table from Kim Jong-un, uh, a brutal dictator uh, who has been lavishly praised uh, by our president, um, they worry that he might uh, make some big deal that has significant regional strategic consequences. Obviously, North Korea would like to see American troops uh, off the Korean Peninsula. Their definition of complete and irreversible denuclearization will almost certainly include some drawdown in our force posture um, and in uh, our role in the region. Um, what might that look like? Uh, it is important that we continue to coordinate closely with our South Korean and Japanese allies uh, on those ongoing uh, negotiations. There's also inevitable tensions that happen due to regional history. Mm -hmm. uh, I was struck um, at just how tense and distant um, the current um, South Korean and Japanese relations yeah. are uh, over two um, tragic chapters uh, in Japan's occupation of South Korea, the so-called comfort women uh, and the coerced uh, employment in industrial um, settings that happened in the 1910-1945 period, uh, which the Japanese consider uh, closed. Uh, things, chapters where uh, there have been uh, negotiated settlements and payments and apologies offered, um, and where current politics in South Korea um, have led to them being reopened. There's enormous tension between these two vital allies. Um, typically, an American role here would be helping pull our allies together, helping them bridge some of this distance, and helping them see a common challenge in the DPRK and in regional security. Um, we have very able ambassadors in both countries uh, who were tremendous and very good uh, diplomatic uh, and defense teams who we met with in both countries. Uh, but I just don't see um, the level of engagement yeah. and the, the centrality of our role uh, in the region. And frankly, some of our most vital allies around the world are hedging. Um, they're looking at whether it's Russia um, in Eastern and Central Europe or it's China in East and Southeast Asia. Um, some of our sort of second tier allies who are not as close and, and long uh, in standing as Japan and South Korea, some of our other regional allies um, are beginning to hedge because they don't know whether we're going to come back and be as fully engaged in the region as we have been. Yeah. Let me tell, reiterate a, an earlier question I had, which is um, how do you think a next administration might formulate um, a, a policy towards um, China and, yeah. and East Asia? Um, and what do you think our best, po let me not put it in the yeah. framework of a next administration. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you think yeah. ought to be the policy formation process? Because yeah. as you pointed out, um, a, a trade war is not a strategy. Right. Um, we don't really have a strategy for China, for Asia, for this century. What do you think it ought to be and yeah. how do we get there? Yeah, a couple, a couple of points then. Just, to, just to, on, on what you, what you, a comment on what, what you were just talking about in terms of allies though, before I get to that. This is so important. The, the, um, again, if you look at it, kind of the global place of the United States, and you do uh, kind of a balance sheet analysis of the assets and liabilities that a country might have to a net assessment, one of the terrific and most important assets we have is alliances. Mm -hmm. You know, China doesn't have anything, and none of our competitors has anything like the U.S. Right. alliance system uh, right. that was put together as you know, kind of in the course of the Cold War, but serves now really as the, as the major mechanism by which we engage in these reason, regions, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they're the, really the force multiplier for our positions around the world. They're really kind of the joint advocates for our system, right, mm -hmm. and our values around the world. Mm -hmm. And under, uh, kind of, you know, undervaluing them is a huge mistake, but that needs constant attention. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think, you know, for example, you referenced it uh, briefly earlier, Senator, you know, putting steel and aluminum tariffs on our closest allies, the rationale for which is national security, saying in a, in a time when we might be under national security pressure, we couldn't rely on them. To supply those um, to supply those uh, commodities really feels insulting to these countries. I think you know it and is it, insulting. It, uh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, and so it's a we're not we haven't done a great job. And I think the next president, right, um, next administration should work very hard on alliance as as a principal. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, our principal thrust of the next administration is kind of rebuilding those alliances and build, rebuilding that trust and addressing the hedging behavior uh, that we uh, that we see. The two other things that I'll, I'll talk about the China policy is that on your points, I think, on, um, on a world where the United States doesn't um, affirmatively go out and try to solve problems, 
right, but rather just pursues, you know, kind of these transactional one-offs, uh, is a world where that's, that's less peaceful, less prosperous, and less secure, and becomes pushed apart, right? And that's mm -hmm. essentially, think, that's an important role, I think, for, for the United States. And mm -hmm. you see what happens, right, where the United States doesn't kind of, um, it, it kind of intervene, I'm not talking militarily, but kind of intervene diplomatically, right? Mm -hmm. Intervene in terms of expectations, uh, what, wh how, you, how you should act if you want to have a good relationship with the United States, and we're not really doing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could talk about the whole world and examples of that. And the last thing before I get to is, is you mentioned the history between Japan and South Korea, right, which is very real. It's interesting that um, this is a hobby horse of mine. Now I'll make an editorial comment, not, uh, is, which is um, we really need as a nation particularly in the policy area to understand history. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, you know, we, it, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, you know, it's a major, for example, that's in, in colleges, which has been decreasing in terms of numbers, right? You know, mm -hmm. that is a really big mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were to ask me what the, kind of the, then there's a few things, but one, what is among the most important things that you should do to be prepared to be a senior policymaker? Uh, you know, to, to, to reach a, a, your goal of really impacting policy in the executive branch or the legislative branch, I think studying history is the most important <laughs> thing you can do. Uh, because you're you certainly, you know, we have a phrase in the United States, oh, that's just history, right? That's not the way the rest of the world works, right? Mm -hmm. History is a very real thing, and you really can't be effective, I don't think, mm -hmm. um, unless you have the kinds of understandings that you were, you, you, you were displaying, kind of understanding the history uh, between us and other parts of the world and among, and among the, in those regions, don't you think? I mean, it's, Absolutely. It's, and it's, I, I discovered uh, a whole chapter in history uh, that I knew nothing about while I was there. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize that Japan's um, colonial administration of Taiwan um, was relatively positively viewed yeah. um, by the people of Taiwan, yeah. um, something I was oblivious to, yeah. and accounts for some of their um, uh, developmental yeah. and security and uh, and cultural uh, aspects right, yeah. that I was oblivious to. Yeah. There are chapter and verse dozens of other things that yeah, I'm sure, sure. Um, I'm unaware of or insufficiently informed about. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the incredible richness and complexity yeah. uh, of China's very ancient culture yeah. uh, means that I think everybody who is trying to be um, a contributor to policymaking has a lot to study yeah. and a lot to understand. Um, it is a, a culture that, uh, back to its Confucian uh, roots, yeah. uh, or its roots in Confucius philosophy, um, has privileged um, stability and order uh, over individual self-expression and accomplishment. Yeah. Unlike the United States, mm -hmm. it was not formed mm -hmm. by individuals uh, fleeing religious persecution mm -hmm. or seeking economic opportunity from other parts of the world. It doesn't share that tradition with us at all. Uh, and visiting the Great Wall of China uh, mm -hmm. for the first time it was an interesting visual symbol, yeah. um, a very ancient, uh, impressive um, edifice um, that was designed to keep out uh, the barbarian hordes and to allow China to be safer and stronger and more secure. Um, the striking thing about how China has pivoted under Xi Jinping is that having been a land power for millennia, it is now seeking to become a naval power. Mm -hmm. um, having had relations of trade and generally you know, sort of positive commerce with the region, uh, it is now asserting itself much more clearly and much more uh, forcefully. Um, and I think that raises questions for us about how well do we understand how the Chinese understand their place in the region, their place in the world, and their place in history. Um, most Americans have grown up in an era where China uh, was a developing country, uh, where China was a mostly poor country that was rapidly ascendant. Yeah. Um, that chapter has ended. And China is now back to a place of being uh, one of the most significant, most developed uh, countries on the planet, uh, a country which is really going to be um, central to the future of economics, politics, security, and stability in this century. Um, let me ask a last question, if I could, because I know we're going to run out of uh, time here in a few more minutes. Um, part of how we practice politics in the United States um, today is more tribal and more inward looking than it's been in much of my lifetime. Um, China um, has a deep and rich history um, and has been internally focused uh, for much of its yeah. recent history, but is now really global, really looking out, really looking at the world uh, as the stage on which it intends to make its mark. Um, how do we best help the conduct of American politics um, return to a time when it was 
uh, as much about character and values as it was about shirts and skins, team red, team blue? Um, and how do we help make real to the American people the consequences for their prosperity and their security, our engagement in the world? Sadly, most presidential campaigns in our history, um, foreign relations have played almost no role at all. Um, how do we help the average American recognize the validity of the point you made, which is this global network of alliances, NATO, um, and um, our alliances with uh, South Korea and China, they haven't drained us. We are not the chumps of history. Um, we built these alliances and these systems in a way that has actually led to our security and prosperity. How do we fix our politics in a way that elevates foreign policy? You know, it's interesting. If you look now at the um, um, Evo Dalder, who was, in, was the ambassador to NATO, you know, uh, and the Obama administration now runs the Council of Foreign Relations in Chicago, mm -hmm. and they do polling. Uh, of American, the American people on national security and foreign policy issues. It's interesting, in the past couple of years, support for international engagement, for trade, for NATO has increased, you know, uh, as it's been under pressure. It's an interesting okay. dynamic, right, that, uh, you know, as uh, you have the president really questioning whether or not we should be, uh, uh, we should adhere to our commitments in NATO, uh, 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 talk about trade the way he, he, uh, that he talks about it. Um, it's actually had a different, it's had, it's had an interesting impact, I think, mm -hmm. where people kind of realize that, in fact, that's not how the United States is stronger. Uh, I don't, that is, that's not the direction the United States is going to, should, should go. That's the first point I wanted, I wanted to make. The second is that it's all about leadership at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the American people rely really principally on their president uh, to articulate a vision and to guide the ship of state in international affairs and the interests of the country. And we've had some bad decisions that were made, frankly, over the last uh, 15 years or so. Um, uh, the Iraq War, for, uh, for example, which was exceedingly costly for the United States in so many ways, right? Um, obviously in terms of blood and treasure and lost lives and, and difficult lives coming out of, uh, coming out of those wars. Um, um, but it cost us in terms of our international uh, kind of our international leadership uh, as well. So these decisions make, make, make a big difference. But at the end of the day, it really is about leadership, uh, I think, uh, for, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for the United States to guide. But there's a sense that the American people have that we are not just another country, uh, that if the world uh, descends into chaos, right, that's not a good thing for the United States. Uh, if in fact, you know, the United States has had tremendous, think about the, think about the economic and security advantages we have had because we have been the technological leader in the world. Mm -hmm. This has repaid us uh, as a country, you know, many, many fold. Um, and I think understanding that these challenges are here in a globalized world and we need to rise to rise to meet them. I think the American people can understand that if they're led and given appropriate policies and, and uh, if politicians make sense. The overall issue that you raise is beyond my, it's beyond my, uh, <laughs> my brief, which is, you know, how to, how to decrease kind of polarization um, in, uh, uh, in society, I think at the end of the day, I've been involved in, I've worked for three presidents and have been involved in every presidential campaign in the last 40 years or so. Um, you know, at the end of the day, there's a mechanism in the United States for addressing these issues and it's, and it's uh, elections. Well, I've got a, a suggestion that I've been working on, I'll just mention yeah. um, as, we, as we come to a close in our time in the next few minutes. Um, and that's national service. Um, yeah. It's something that um, both presidents Bush and Clinton uh, championed. It was President Clinton who actually signed into law um, the program known as the Corporation for National Community Service that makes AmeriCorps possible. Um, we have hundreds of thousands of young Americans who would like to be able uh, to spend a year with Teach for America or with City Year or with the Peace Corps. Um, there are four or five times as many applicants as there are slots. Um, we are struggling as a country with the cost of higher education. Uh, we have far too many young people um, going to college or university, leaving with a, a significant yeah. burden of, of debt, um, and frankly, healing our sense of um, what it means to be an American and this sense of tribalism, uh, I think is most directly and best addressed through service. Um, men and women who serve in our armed forces come back with a heightened sense of our place in the world mm -hmm. and our commitment to each other across differences. Uh, my own father served as a sergeant in the 1st Infantry and long said to me that it was the time he spent um, responsible for a group of other young men. At that point, it was all men. Um, but from different, uh, different races, different religions, different regions of our country really gave him a sense of what it meant to be an American for the first time. 
Um, I had the honor of helping lead and train a group of 150 AmeriCorps members from 15 cities mm. uh, and was struck at how much they learned about yeah. our country and each other in their time of service. So I've, I've introduced a bill with Jack Reed and uh, Amy Klobuchar and yeah. Kirsten Gillibrand and a couple of other senators um, that would give you um, four years of state university tuition in exchange for two years of full-time service to our country. Mm -hmm. You'd still have to work out room, books, board, other fees, but it would make higher education mm -hmm. essentially tuition-free for those young Americans willing to step forward and serve our country mm -hmm. for two years in a civilian role. It's one small suggestion. It's a good big uh, idea, though. I, I but think, it's uh, one I hope you know who would, you know, and you know who I, I uh, having spent a lot of time in, in, in the in the world of national security and the military, I think that the I think if you had the Joint Chiefs on the stage with us here today. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, uh, I think they'd be willing to recommend to President Trump that because that, 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 this is not that expensive of a, of a yeah. proposition. I think you could get the leadership of the Pentagon to recommend that they fund it out of the Pentagon. <laughs> I do. Uh, That'd no, be sorry, a great deal, wouldn't it? <laughs> I do because I think it would. I think it really. I think that our military leadership, our national security leadership, sees exactly the things that you're talking about, Senator, which is the the importance of focusing on service to the country. Um, I would be for mandatory uh, teaching of civics in every uh, high school in the, in the United States as well. But I think you'd find, uh, don't you think, mm -hmm. I think you'd find the, yep. I think you'd find the uniform military uh, uh, at the front of the line, um, mm -hmm. uh, seeing it as a way to um, uh, enhance the country's uh, character mm -hmm. uh, and to um, better protect this democracy, which I think this is a whole, we could do a whole other discussion on the, on the mm -hmm. sentence I'm about to say now, which is I do think that democracy is under more pressure than it's been under since the 30s, and this would be, I think, exactly the right way to go about addressing some, some of that. The, the core concern I have about the functionality of Congress today is that the underpinning, the, the sort of definitional basis of democracy is compromise. If you don't mm -hmm. respect the idea of compromise, it is very hard for Congress to work. And we have a Congress today where the proposals on each side are increasingly um, unilateral yeah. and extremist, meaning uh, we're proposing things that not one Republican sponsors or supports. They're proposing things that not one Democrat proposes or supports. Legislation is only ever successful or sustainable if it's genuinely bipartisan. My hope as we engage with China, as we look towards uh, this century and our role in the world, uh, Tom, is that we will get back to a practice uh, of being genuinely bipartisan yeah. um, and of reflecting the best uh, in our traditions um, as we try and formulate uh, a sustainable and a successful U.S.-China policy. Tom, let me thank, thank you for being you. a part of this, and um, I know we've I'm got I'm here to interrupt and call Nancy. time. Please join me in showing our appreciation for this wonderful conversation. It's been our privilege at the Center for Political Communication to host this event along with the Department of Political Science and International Relations. Do not forget that if you want to revisit this event or any of our other events, we do provide YouTube videos, a podcast of the event, and a full complete transcription of the event that is available on our website so you can't escape the CPC at all. And to continue on with this theme, stay with us next fall. Our theme for fall 2019 is direction democracy. And I think the last part of the conversation certainly set that up beautifully. So check our website, join our email list, and make sure you join us for National Agenda 2019 when we take a look at the direction this country is heading, has been, is now, and heading towards. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much. Really a wonderful conversation.